Are there any questions before we begin? Okay, so we're now in chapter two of the lecture notes. And uh, chapter one, chapter one was all about motivating the work that we'll do for the rest of the book and then the rest of the course. And it's the basic idea of chapter one was to set up um, and to motivate all of the notions that we want to uh, make rigorous in the later chapters. For example, we didn't give any real definitions in the first part of the book. So we hand waved a lot. And I a lot of the notions which I said were probably somewhat familiar to you can actually be made rigorous and and we can nail those down more or less completely. Uh, but as I said, when we were going through all that stuff, there is some notion which in which or for which all of those things that we, all of the problems that we discussed, all of the um, comparisons that we made already are kind of commonsensical. But this is a mathematics course, so we want to give them some rigorous definition. Again, I want to emphasize that while this is a mathematics course, we're never going to do mathematics for the sake of mathematics in this course. We're going to um, use mathematics in the service of trying to understand physical uh, problems that we can solve. So we're in chapter two, and uh, this will come in two parts. So the title of the chapter is Notation and Fundamental Definitions. And uh, I could probably also say the other theme of chapter two is tying up a couple of the loose ends that we started in, um, in, in, in chapter one. Not all of them, just a few of them. So we'll revisit a couple of the things that uh, we discussed and make those make those rigorous, that is to say, tidy them up a bit. So the first thing I want to do is when we were talking about how small something is or maybe how something big something is, we I, I use these order relations or order symbols without defining them. I said, you know, something goes to zero like epsilon squared as epsilon goes to zero. So what what does that mean exactly? So let's make that rigorous here. First of all, before I get into the definitions, um, we'll, I'll use a common notation as much as um, possible and as often as I can remember. So this IRA is my symbol for an interval that is centered on the point A and is of radius R on either side of A. So in other words, it's the open interval A minus R to A plus R, not including the endpoints. So sometimes we use the same notation to include the endpoints. So that would be the closed version of this interval, but uh, I'm gonna try to be consistent. And this is generally, generally speaking, gonna be an open interval. Of course, to make sense, R should be positive. So here's my definition of what we mean for a function, two functions to be big O related. Suppose that D is an open set of the complex, um, th th this is the complex vector space having D dimensions. So um, you're already familiar with real three-dimensional space and real two-dimensional space. Two-dimensional space, real two-dimensional spaces merely the set of ordered pairs of real numbers. Three-dimensional space is ordered triples of real numbers. And complex d-dimensional space is going to be um, d-tuples, okay? That is a vector of length of d, each, of, each component of which is going to be a complex number. So I hope this doesn't cause anyone to stumble. C uh, superscript D is complex d-dimensional space. If you don't like thinking about complex uh, spaces, you can think about real 
um, the RD, which is the um, the real space of D dimensions. So suppose that D is an open set. Suppose that epsilon is some number, could be positive or negative, and suppose that D is positive. Assume that F and G are functions of D cross ID into the continuous or, or into uh, the complex function. So what does cross mean? This means uh, the Cartesian product. So it just means that if I look at F as a function from that domain, So this just means that the first thing that's going to go in or the, the first argument of F is going to be some vector okay, from D. And the second thing that has to go into that is some scalar like epsilon. So it's a function of two variables, but actually it's more than two variables. The thing I put in the first argument is going to be a vector. The thing I put in the second argument is going to be a scalar. The thing that comes out in the end is a vector. So we say that if I put in that vector and scalar, I get something from RD out, okay? And the only rule here is that U has to come from the set D and epsilon has to come from this interval, I delta epsilon naught. So both of those functions are gonna be continuous functions. Mathematically, I hope that you know what a continuous function is. But if you don't know the exact rigorous definition of a continuous function, it's almost good enough to have that good old grade school idea in the back of your mind that a continuous function is one where when you draw its graph, you don't lift up your, your pencil. We say that F is big O of G at X in D as epsilon goes to zero. So this is for a fixed X. So X is in D. But this big O notation is a limiting process, essentially. So we say that F is big O of G at a point X as epsilon goes to zero. And the notation we're going to use to express that is all of that. So in notation, all of that means what we've written in words. That's all a good notation is. It, a good notation is just a replacement for a bunch of words. Okay. If and only if there exists numbers delta naught, which depends on X in general, in zero to delta, and a constant, which depends on X, that is positive, such that F of X epsilon is less than in absolute value, C times the absolute value of G of X epsilon. For all epsilon, in I delta. All right, so that's great, right? Everybody's happy. That's a mathematical definition. What does it mean? Is it useful? Uh, is it useful? That's a good question. So what we're going to do is rarely, well, not rarely, but we're not we're going to get such a good working knowledge of what this definition means, we're hardly going to refer back to the definition. All right. The idea is um, get enough definitions so where we know what this means so that you don't really have to think about the definition underlying it. But if you have to prove something, you do come back to the definition. Most often, we're going to be using this in the following form. Most often we're going to have a simple function of epsilon and we're going to say something like this is order epsilon squared as epsilon goes to zero. You probably already have a good idea of what this means already. It means as epsilon going to zero, I'm going to, F is going to zero at least quadratically, maybe faster than quadratic, maybe but not linearly, okay? So it has some sort of meaning. We'll come back to that in an example. Now, if we can demonstrate that this delta that we produce or that we need 
and the C that we need for this definition is entirely independent of X, then we say that F is uniformly big O. Uh, is big O of G uniformly in D as epsilon. So we really don't care what the values of X are because we can produce one value of delta and one value of C, which works for all the values of X. So this says that really that process that we're describing through this definition is only interested in the size of epsilon. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, so this is big O, and this is the typical use of a big O. It's as epsilon is going to a finite number. Now, I'm writing epsilon for a reason, and that's because 99.99% of the time, I'm going to be interested in the case where, what, epsilon is going to 5? No. Epsilon is going to infinity? No. This is the case where epsilon is getting small. It's going to 0. Okay, so that's why I'm using epsilon. But I could use any, I could use any parameter that that you like or any variable. So this is the typical use of this. I have a function which depends on epsilon either explicitly or implicitly in some way that I can quantify. In this case, it's dependent upon epsilon completely explicitly. So let's see what it says. Suppose that epsilon is positive in this definition. Again, we're going to be interested in the case where epsilon is getting smaller, not larger. If it's getting larger, then you'll see something different happen. F, epsilon, I claim, is big O of epsilon, or big O of, yeah, just of epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero. Sometimes we say is order one in epsilon means the same thing. Uh, when I say order one, that I'm really referring to the power on epsilon here. So why does this happen? So what we want to be able to show is that this definition holds. As uh, putting on our math ma uh, mathematician hats, that means we're going to want to prove something. We're going to have to want, we're going to want to show that the definition holds. So that means writing a little mini proof. Okay, now the reason this is true is because epsilon cubed becomes dominated by epsilon as epsilon gets smaller and smaller. If epsilon is getting larger and larger, let's say going off to infinity, then there's no way in hell that epsilon is going to dominate epsilon cubed. It's the other way around, okay? So epsilon, I claim, dominates epsilon, sorry, epsilon to the first power dominates epsilon cubed as epsilon goes to zero, okay? In other words, for small values of epsilon. So here's the proof. In particular, if epsilon is between zero and one, then epsilon cubed is always less than epsilon, right? Do you believe that? So that's, a, that's proof by a picture, but there are plenty of ways you can show it. So if I graph epsilon, linear a function, which is just linear in epsilon, namely epsilon, and I graph epsilon cubed, they can, oh, I don't want that. And there's epsilon cubed, right? There's my epsilon. Epsilon cubed is smaller than epsilon as epsilon gets smaller and smaller. Okay. Again, if we're on the I meant to write here one, this is epsilon there. So if, if epsilon is getting, if epsilon is bigger than one and getting larger and larger, then the, the role is reversed. So here's our proof then. Suppose we set delta equal to one. There's no X involved in this problem at all, okay? There's no X. Um, I didn't give any examples in the text yet involving X, but some of the, maybe some of the homework problems that are coming in the future some, someday, uh, we, can, we can do some examples like that. But this is really getting at the heart of the matter, you know, what's going on. Okay, so here's my little proof. Delta is equal to one, so there's no X for delta to depend on. 
if epsilon is less than delta naught, less than or equal to, then we know that an absolute value, if we take absolute value of f, that's going to be less than 2 epsilon cubed plus epsilon. Why plus epsilon? I'm using the triangle inequality. That flips the sign here. I'm using the fact that epsilon is a positive number. So if I take the absolute value, I just get that using triangle inequality. So this whole thing has to be less than three epsilon. I skipped one step, right? So this, the intermediate step is this term here is less than two epsilon, right? Because of this step. So it's clearly less than three epsilon as long as my epsilon is less than delta naught, which is set equal to one. So I can identify the two variables in the definition, the two constants. Delta naught has to be one and C has to be three. And if you look back, there's where the three goes, the C. Right. And where is the delta naught involved here? Well, it's involved in the definition of this interval. But notice that I've already restricted epsilon to be greater than zero. So I only have to really care about one side of that interval. And it's easily simply expressed as epsilon is less than delta. Okay, greater than zero, less than delta, delta naught. Any questions about that simple little example? So now you can do a hundred different examples like that. And the usual case is you're going to have multiple terms which depend on epsilon, and you have to figure out if in this scenario where epsilon is going to zero, which term dominates. And once you know which term dominates, then you can collect all the other terms into one. And uh, you can come up with with uh, an answer. Questions? All right. So I included definitions here that are not always included in um, some lecture notes or books or courses. So the first definition was um, big O at a finite limit. But we can also take an infinite limit. Now, if I'm using an infinite limit, and I, I decided this a little bit late, so if you look at the lecture notes, they've changed recently. Um, now I'm using lambda for large parameter or goes to infinity parameter. Uh, that's because lambda, you know, L for large. Yeah. Is it the same O for the computational complexity? Uh, that is yes. And then which one do you use in the complexity? I mean, in the complexity, the infinity one or the higher one? Uh, generally speaking, uh, complexity, you're worried about operations going to infinity, getting large. So it's this one. And we'll do an example like that. Big O and infinity means we're interested in that parameter going large, getting close to infinity. Suppose that M is a positive number. And suppose that f and g are functions now from d, which is the same as it was before. d is just some subset of the complex uh, d-dimensional space, cd, cross m to infinity. So this is, again, a Cartesian product of objects. So for each vector, you're going to pair it with a number, a real number, which is greater than m and less than infinity. So suppose that f and g from those sets into complex numbers are continuous functions. I think I said they were continuous or they were, com yeah. I can also make this go into C, C, D, right? I can also, instead of just having complex valued functions, I could put, I could have functions which are uh, vector valued functions. But okay, no big deal. So we're supposing that these two functions are continuous. We say that f is big O of g at x and d as lambda gets large. And we write exactly this notation here. This is very similar to the last time. And again, notation, all notation is, is a way of summarizing a bunch of words, but without having to write through words, right? So it's a shorthand, although you can see it not saving too many words here, but um, 
I'd rather write symbols than words. If and only if there exist numbers, now I need a number M0, which could depend on X. That's what that means. M0 could depend on X. And it's greater than or equal to capital M. And a constant C, which is again dependent possibly on X, but is a positive number, such that F of X lambda is less than a constant, of course in absolute values, absolute value of G of X lambda for all lambda that are greater than M0. What this really means is that for lambda large, my F can be bounded by, by G in absolute value with a constant. That's all that means. And again, we mean exactly the same thing, but we add the word uniform, uniformly if M and C actually don't depend on the value of X and D. So I want to give a few examples of, uh, uh, of problems like this. So let's see here. Yeah. I had to remember or recall while I get why I gave this definition here, and now I do. Okay, so um, before I give an example of uh, problems involved uh, of that type, I want to talk a little bit about exponential functions and polynomial functions. Okay, or I want to talk about things which get exponentially large versus things which get polynomial large. Polynomially large is that a is that a term? So. If lambda is getting larger and larger, then the exponential function gets large. Everybody knows that, right? The graph of that thing starts going off the charts. Polynomials also get large, okay? But polynomials, what are they? They're just objects which are constructed from monomials. So I'm gonna take a basic monomial. Suppose that M is a natural number. This is my term for natural number. That's a counting number. That's a number one, two, three. It's a positive integer. Sometimes I'll be interested in uh, the counting numbers plus zero, and I'll denote that as n sub zero. But you don't have to worry about that just yet. Okay, so suppose that m is a counting number, and we're going to consider the size of this guy that's exponential versus the size of this guy. Let m be, in fact, any counting number that you like. There's always going to be a constant m0, which can depend on m, and generally it, generally it does, such that if lambda is bigger than m0, then e to the lambda is greater than lambda to the m. So everybody everybody probably, probably believes that, and you've gone through one or more proofs in your uh, uh, education to see that this is true. Uh, let's let's do another one just to convince you that this is always the case. Sometimes this is abbreviated as exponential beats polynomial, right? Exponential growth beats polynomial growth. Okay, suppose that lambda is greater than zero. That's the case we're interested in. In fact, we're going to be interested in a certain constant. We can use Taylor's theorem. Taylor's theorem says that we can expand e to the lambda as a polynomial plus an error. Okay, now I'm going to expand out to order m plus one. You might not see Taylor's theorem applied like this, but this is exactly Taylor's theorem. Um, sometimes you'll see Taylor's theorem written like, um, you know, especially if you're in the physics or engineering community, you'll see it written like this with a approximate symbol, right? And then you won't see this term included. Okay. This term here is known as the remainder term. It's very important. If I add the remainder term, then I can replace this approximate equals with equals. Okay. And in fact, the great thing about, by the way, this, this is my little joke for you. If you have any, if you have any function, let's say of lambda, and you have any other function, and they don't equal, you can always write the equal up to a remainder. Okay. The remainder is just the difference of the two functions. It's the error. Okay. 
The important thing about Taylor is that you know the size of the error. You know a functional representation of that R. It's namely this, but it's not perfect, right? Because Taylor says that um, you can know the exact form of this error, but only up to an, uh, some unknown constant or some unknown parameter. That's the thing we call eta. Now, you might complain and say, this is supposed to be the m uh, to this is supposed to be the derivative of order m plus two, evaluated at some unknown point, right? Why is this? Why is this e to the eta? It's a trick question. Because every derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function, right? That's why that guy makes the appearance back. Why is this guy positive? Well. If eta is between, it's an unknown parameter, but it's between zero and, and lambda, it's positive, right? E, to, e at any uh, positive number is going to be positive. Actually, E to any power is positive. That's all we care about. What we're really interested in is this approximation here up to this point. Okay? Now, um, let's, call, let's give that a name. Let's call that polynomial P lambda. So we know that E lambda is greater than this polynomial P lambda because we can throw away this positive term. I don't care how big M is, right? Um, all these terms here are positive in sight. Now this guy might be small or large, I don't know, based on the size and the position of lambda and you know how big M is. It's positive, we're gonna throw it away. So we know that E lambda is bigger than P lambda. But P lambda is a polynomial of degree M plus one. And here's something that I'm going to take for granted that you know, that if I have a polynomial uh, with a, okay, so there is one other thing we need to keep in mind about this. And this polynomial has a positive coefficient on its highest term, right? So we always know how the graph of this looks like. At infinity, what's it looking like? It's always going up here, getting larger and larger. If, if it was negative, if it had negative coefficient, then it would be going down to infinity, right? But that's not the case. The case is this one. We're going up to infinity. What do we know about a polynomial degree m plus 1, which has a positive coefficient, leading coefficient, versus the monomial lambda m? This guy always wins in the end, okay? This guy wins in the end, but you might have to take lambda big enough. So I'm gonna take it for granted that you can, that it's, it's a little proof to show this, it's not too hard, that if lambda is bigger than some number m zero, now this is where m zero might depend on little m, okay? Might depend on little m. Then eventually this guy's gonna take over and dominate for all the rest of eternity. If that's true, then we've proven our little result. Okay, we have the chain of inequalities. This is bigger than P. P is bigger than the monomial. Therefore, this is bigger than that. Okay. I think there's a very clear choice of M1. But then you can just pick M0 equal to M plus 1. That's probably one. That may be true, yeah. Yeah, you just cancel one copy and then you, the rest of them is possible. So if uh, well, yeah, so the problem is you don't, yeah, you have to be mindful of the size of these guys, right? But yeah, let's see if you use, um, so you, so you want to, I think you're saying you want to make this guy, no, actually, the, 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 the bigger guy. this one here. Yeah, yeah. So you want to do what with this one? Uh, you take, if you pick lambda. Uh, you make m not to be small m plus one factorial. Oh, right. Okay. You send on one copy. Yeah. But that is essentially what lambda m, but you also have a lot of positive terms. Right? Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. So I'm not, I, so it is true that you should be able to find the, the this value sort of analytically. Yeah. I, I was I was a little bit lazy on that point. Okay. All, all that to say, I'm going to use this in a very standard little uh, example. Uh, but I, I wanted to get it out of the way before. I think we kind of already used this in chapter one, this fact. 
Oh, okay. So now you can extend this a little bit, and I'm I'm stating this as a corollary because I'm I'm saying the the extension here isn't too too difficult. The main thing was the the previous uh, proof. For any r greater than zero, there exists an m, which can depend on r such that if lambda is bigger than m that m that m zero, then e to the lambda is bigger than lambda to the r. Okay. If r is less than one, then this is not a big deal because uh, you know this function is sublinear, and we already know that that linear is dominated by this. Um, it's a little bit harder if r is bigger than one, but even that case isn't that hard. In any case, I'll leave it to you to determine this one. Now, if this is true, um, did I screw that up? Might have. Then. then this is also true. I was thinking, see, I might, let's let me just think of it. I think the one that I actually want here, I got a little bit. I'm gonna put a question mark here for a second. So this one I know is true. What can I deduce directly from this? I can take reciprocals, right? So I know that I get e to the minus lambda is less than one over lambda to the r power as lambda gets large. Oh, I just, okay, it's, I don't really have to write anything there. So this is just taking reciprocals. If this is true, then this has to be true, right? Just take reciprocals. All right, now, did, uh, so we're all honest in this course, and I type these out at lightning speed, and sometimes my brain shuts off. So let's think about this guy here. As lambda's getting larger, as lambda is getting large, uh, one over lambda is getting small. So this guy is going to one, right? Is that right? And this guy is going to zero, right? I think you mean either negative lambda. Yeah, I think I meant to write that and I wrote this, but I'm trying to uh, explore my mind. <laughs> So I believe just need to just need to replace that fact with that. I meant to write minus lambda and not reciprocal of lambda. All right. It's always good to just step back and say, what was this guy thinking here? We can't we can't beat. So this guy is eventually going to get less than one, right? And this guy here is just going to be one, right? As lambda gets larger and larger. So it doesn't make sense. Okay, so this is what I meant, I think. Okay, now, oh well, yeah, obviously, because that's what I'm using there. Okay, so all of that to say, suppose I have a function g of lambda equals e to the minus, minus e minus lambda plus four over lambda. Then I claim that g of lambda is big O of one over lambda as lambda goes to infinity. Okay. And I'm claiming that this is true because for all lambda greater than zero, one over lambda is greater than e to the minus lambda. All right, I think that's true. Um, and it's true, okay, so if you ever 
if you ever ha have a question about something so sort of trivial like this, you can always go back to um, Taylor and check it, right? So let's check this. So e to the lambda, I'm going to use Taylor and say that that's one plus lambda plus uh, lambda squared over two e to the some unknown. Okay. Now, if lambda is positive, then this number is positive, and this unknown constant eta between lambda and zero is, of course, positive, and this is positive. So if I get rid of that positive term, then this is bigger than uh, one over one plus lambda. So it's definitely bigger than lambda if I throw away the one plus lambda. And this holds true for any lambda, which is positive. Now, if I take reciprocals, I get obviously this, okay? My only question was, is this, is this true for all lambda? I know it's true for some lambda greater than M from the previous result, but now I just wanted to confirm it's true for actually all lambda. Okay, so we know that. Um, we can we can make a comfortable margin though and say, okay, let's set M not equal to one. We don't have to set it equal to zero. We can just set it equal to one. Then I know if I take the absolute value of G of lambda, again, I'm gonna use triangle inequality. Uh, this term is positive. It had a negative uh, sign in front of it. Just get rid of that. Of course, this term is initially positive as long as lambda is positive. So that remains four over lambda. This is less than one over lambda. So throw that in there just by this relationship here. So the whole thing is less than five over lambda. And so the result holds with C equals five right there and M not equal one. But of course you can see that the C and the M aren't don't necessarily have to be tight. Uh, okay, so that's one uh, sort of drawback of this notation and the usage here is um, we don't have to be too uh, worried about what is the size of M naught, okay, for this for this to hold. We don't have to worry too much about the size of C. Now, some certain C values may may not work, but lots of C values will. For example, I could have chosen to make this work with C equals six. Does everyone agree and understand why? The reason is because once I can establish it for C equals five, I could establish it for C equals six because five is, five is less than six. Remember, in the definition of all of this jazz, I really only have to worry about getting bigger. It's the bigger that counts. Okay, so I could take C equals six, seven, okay, 100, doesn't really matter. Um, and by the way, here's another, here's another fact, G of Lambda, we could say that that's big O of five or Lambda, right? And then if we choose five over Lambda, then we can prove this result. Okay. We would just replace this with a five here. So we could prove the result with C equals one. So everyone get that, okay? I can also, let me blow your minds further, that everything that we've done sort of seems like it should be involving positive numbers or, right? Um, I can also say this, minus five, right? Because when I take the absolute value, all that matters is the, the magnitude. And I could make this work with C equals one. Now, by the way, every time you write an order symbol, you have to write something else. Order symbols can never be naked. They always have to be clothed. Okay. It's uh, another way of saying this is uh, nature abhors a singularity. You can't put something there without covering it. So what I mean is, Every time I write an order symbol, you have to write the accompanying direction of lambda, okay? So if I write something involving 
big O of epsilon, I have to write epsilon gets small or it goes to zero. Now, whenever people do, uh, someone referred to work estimates whenever you're doing algorithms, right? You've all seen these before. Order n cubed means nothing, okay? You mean it's order n cubed as n gets large. The number of operations gets larger and larger, okay? Order symbols always have to be accompanied with a direction of the parameter. You have to know where it's going, otherwise it's meaningless. Writing order something is meaningless, okay, without that extra bit of information. Okay, here's another example. Um, it doesn't really matter um, if we have, okay, so that's a typo I need to fix. So, so this should be squiggle, squiggle, lambda, squiggle, squiggle, lambda. Lambda. Um, it doesn't matter what power P you put here, okay? That this one over Lambda P is always going to be dominating uh, the exponential at infinity, okay? Because it's a, it's a exponential to a minus large power. So it gets really, really small. And therefore, this guy is what dominates at infinity. Now, you can figure out what value of capital M you need and what value of C you need. I'm not saying what they are or how they depend on these unknown constants C1 and C2, but I don't care. Whatever they are, I claim you can get them. Whatever C1 and C2 happen to be, you can always uh, conclude this result. Are, are there any questions? Let me see. So I want to try to, how do I make this thing not this? Oh, I think, there we go. Got it. Okay. Any questions from uh, online community? Okay. So those are pretty standard and simple examples, right? Uh, here's an order. Uh, a, this this one you can call a work example, okay? But you know it's not not really, but you can kind of think of it that way. Now, whenever we're putting together uh, work estimates in, in algorithms, usually you're writing this as W of of n is equal to some polynomial in n, p of n. All right, but this is just where n has to be um, a positive integer, okay? So what kind of function has, what kind of function looks like this? You put in an integer, positive integer, and you get a value out. That's called a sequence. Sequence is just a function. So we usually write, a sequence is just a function from the counting numbers, including zero, into uh, C or R, could actually be into, uh, into CD, okay? But let's make life uh, simple for ourselves and just take this into R. Now, we usually don't write A of N, we usually write A subscript N, yeah? That's the common thing to do. Now, my, my definition did not apply to sequences, right? It was for continuous variables. But you can easily see how these things extend for, for discrete variables. Not, not a big deal, right? Um, especially as things get large. Now, things getting small, it doesn't make as much sense because how can I take a limit of a discrete variable as it converges to some, something else? Okay, um, it's a little bit hard to do, but for discrete numbers, integers, positive integers specifically getting larger, that's there's no problem there. So I can think about finding order relations involving sequences or for sequences 
as n gets large. Okay, so all I have to do is find capital M and C. Okay. And this is saying nothing about whether a sequence is converging or anything like that. It's simply saying um, we're, we're trying to get some perspective of the size of this thing as the parameter is getting large. So I claim that A of N, if it's this polynomial here in N, doesn't have to be a polynomial, by the way. It could be a logarithmic function or exponential or transcendental function. But here we're just giving a simple example involving a polynomial. 2 thirds n, n squared minus 1 half n cubed. And so what would you expect for this guy as n gets large? Now, this is where it's really not exactly like work estimate because work estimates we know always have the highest order term or the coefficient to the highest order power is always positive, okay? Because you don't do negative amount of work, okay? or there aren't a negative amount of operations to, to do something. So this is where this is no longer exactly like work estimates, okay? But remember, it can be generally applied to any sequence. So I'm claiming that as n gets large, this term and cube term dominates the n squared. And so this whole thing is just an order n cubed. So let's see if we can prove that. We want to show that there's an integer n naught greater than one, greater than or equal to one, such that if little n is bigger than that n naught, then a n is less than a constant times n cubed for some constant that we can determine. All right. So if little n is bigger than n naught equal to one, then obviously n cubed is bigger than n squared. The proof is by simply a picture, right? This is true for continuous variables. It's also true for discrete variables. n cubed dominates n squared for n bigger than one. Dominate simply means that this inequality has that direction. So if n is bigger than n naught, which is one, a n cubed, let's take the absolute value, apply triangle inequality and so on. Triangle inequality, remember, n is a positive number. So when we apply the triangle inequality, it's going to flip a sign. Namely, this minus becomes a plus. Okay. If n was also negative, then we'd have to be worried about whether n was a negative number or positive number, right? Because n n cubed whenever n is a negative number is still a negative number. Not so with the square. This is less than 2 thirds n cubed plus 1 half n cubed, which is less than 7 6 n cubed, I think. Um, you can check my uh, fraction, fractional arithmetic or arithmetic involving fractions. So c is 7 6 and n naught is 1. Right, and it doesn't matter that this was a negative, okay? And I could have just as easily written a n is um, equal big O. By the way, when I write it in handwriting, I sometimes put the, the squiggly on there. I'm gonna try to avoid that because in my, in the lecture notes, it's just big O. There's gonna be something called little O, which is coming along shortly. and little o is just going to be comparatively much smaller. It's going to look much smaller than a... So big O should look like a capital, capital O compared to all the other letters. And uh, little o is going to be even smaller than a lower case O. All right, so I could even write, before I lost my train of thought, that this is less than um, 5 n cubed. Right? What, there's nothing wrong with that, right? And I could use C equals one. The negative doesn't need doesn't matter. And all I need to say is as n gets large. Does that make sense? And everything simplifies by writing writing it that way instead. Questions? All right, let's move on to little o. Uh, 
Big O for some reason is uh, easy for me to remember. Big or little O is always hard to remember. I always have to come back to the definition or an equivalent property to figure out uh, if I'm right about the little O property. All right. <clears throat> All the usual stuff, D is a subset, an open subset of uh, CD. Epsilon is a real number. That's going to be our target limit. Usually, epsilon naught is just zero. Delta is greater than zero. We're going to assume that f and g are continuous functions from their do domains into the complex numbers. If you don't like dealing with complex numbers, you can, of course, make that a real number. I uh, hope everyone is comfortable working with complex numbers. In case you've never seen them before, and I'm sure this is crazy uh, to say that, a complex number can be represented as two real numbers summed together with this imaginary unit, I. And there's rules of um, addition. That's straightforward. It's the same as vector addition. And there's rules of multiplying complex numbers together. And the trick to remembering the complex number uh, multiplication is you always just remember that anytime you have an I squared, you're going to write minus one. It's that weird number that when you square it, you get minus one. That's, that's all you have to really remember so far. We're not going to use too much more technology than that until we start talking about complex integ integration in the complex plane. Anyone taking complex variables course before? Okay, good. Um, I'll review everything you need to know, so don't even need to panic about uh, integration in the complex plane. Okay, we say that F is little o of G at X as epsilon goes to epsilon naught, and we are gonna shorthand that with that notation. If and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, this is one where it's a for every, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta naught, which depends on generically X and, and uh, alpha, such that, Absolute value of f of x epsilon is less than alpha times g of x epsilon for all epsilon in I delta. Now, here's the trick with this guy. The thing you need to remember and, or think about is there's no fixed constant C anymore here. This constant is constantly getting smaller. Okay, that's the way you should think about it. It's constantly getting smaller. Right, so this guy has to be dominated by this term plus or with the multiplication of this small parameter involved. We say it's uniform uh, with respect to uh, this, no this notion as epsilon goes to epsilon naught, or in other words, it's uniformly little o, if and only if all of that holds same same deal, except that delta no longer depends on, on X, okay? If I can come up with that delta, which is independent of X, then I say this is a uniform property. It's a uniform little O property. Little O is a little bit harder to understand and imagine because it um, involves this diminishingly large parameter, this parameter which decays away. So I don't want you to memorize this definition, I want you to get used to applying an equivalent property that we're going to prove momentarily. It's much easier to remember. It's much easier to use. Is it some kind of epsilon pairing? Yeah, so the way you can think about it is, remember um, continuity has an epsilon delta, right? My, the problem here is I've already taken up the role of epsilon as being my limit parameter. So I can't use another, I guess I could have. So I'm using var epsilon here. I could have used the regular epsilon. So this guy here plays the role of that regular epsilon, okay? So it's the thing that appears on the right-hand side of this, just like in the continuity definition. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta, which depends on epsilon such that blah, blah, blah. In the end, the epsilon will appear here on the right-hand side. 
So this is kind of like the role of epsilon in the continuity or limit. So you just first string the yeah the error, and now you say that when it, however you string the error, I can actually push yeah uh, the other data. Right. Data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can see right away what you can see right away how to connect it to a continuity, right? Divide both sides by this number here, right? Throw it over here. Okay, so if I divide that, then I really do have an alpha over here. And that, in fact, that's the way to remember the. Um, it's a it's a it's a mnemonic device to remember this, but it's a it's it's a good way to remember the thing that we're going to show the equivalence device. So if I, if you don't follow what I'm saying, don't worry about it. But so f of x epsilon over g of x epsilon. If that junk above is true, of course, I can write a zero here and put absolute values. And lo and behold, I get an epsilon, right? Actually, let me not confuse things. I'm going to put my alpha there. Remember what the definition of a, a limit is? For every alpha, where you have to use alpha now, there exists a delta dependent upon upon, del, uh, upon alpha, such that if the interval range is in the delta neighborhood, then this function minus its limit in difference, in that difference of that in absolute value is less than alpha. So what this is saying is that this limit, the limit of this quotient has to approach zero. If, if and only if we have a big or, or a little O property. And in fact, that's what we're going to show momentarily. Can we do all sort of need nicer functions for a little O than to apply some kind of big O? Um, I mean, with, with big O, since it's, it's basically, uh, um, you, you define it for continuous functions, but you can do lots of things with it since it's just bounded. But, Looks like maybe I might need things to be a little prettier here with maybe yeah maybe more restrictive yeah yeah and that, there are certainly different concepts we'll use them in different ways and um in fact for next uh, so I will um I'll try to remember to put in a very simple example uh for for our, for the next lecture. And it kind of explains big O, little O in, in terms that you'll never forget after that. Um, and it's and it's in the usage or it's in the setting of Taylor's theorem. I can use a, a little O or a big O when I describe the size of the remainder term. And I'll, I'll explain that to you. And I think once you see that, then you'll kind of say, oh yeah, that's the difference between little O and big O. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, so you don't have to write it down or memorize it. But this little O idea is a little bit uh, different than the big O. The big O is all about bounding in terms of size, okay? And this is all about something getting, something going to zero, okay? This alpha is getting smaller and smaller. Um, we can have little o at a, for a finite limit. We can also have little o at infinity and in the notion. Um, I think now that you've seen it a few times, you can translate it yourself without too much trouble. The notion at infinity is, um, well, we say that f is little o of g as lambda goes to infinity, if and only if for every alpha. There has to be an every alpha thing going on here. This replaces that static constant that we had before. There exists an M. Now I use M to represent a big parameter rather than a than a small delta parameter. Um, that depends on X and alpha as usual, such that if um, such that uh, F uh, of X and lambda in absolute value is less than alpha times G of X and lambda in absolute value. The, again, the point is this alpha is getting smaller, and this holds as long as uh, lambda is in this interval, okay? So as long as lambda is large enough, then this holds. And again, it's a little bit hard for me to say, give a good relationship for this, 
the, the easiest way I remember it is that, okay, just divide both sides by this G. And then really what this is saying is that the ratio What this has to be getting smaller, right? That's what that means. It has to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as lambda is going to infinity. Does everyone get that? Another way you can look at it is if you like the technical definition of limit, okay? Oops, I meant to use an alpha. We can't use epsilon because epsilon is reserved for something else. Um, I guess I could have in this case, but epsilon is my parameter, which, which is uh, re reserved for something else. But if this is getting arbitrarily small, then this this has to be going to zero as a limit. That's the idea. Okay. Now again. We're saving needless writing here. Um, we can state all of the results that follow in terms of parameters going off to infinity or parameters converging to finite limits. We know how, so there's a language for conversion, right? And you all, all know now you're learning the language for conversion, okay? If I want to prove a big O or little O property as a parameter is getting, going to a finite limit, then I can, Establish the same. Uh, I know how I have my Rosetta Stone, so I can translate that into lambda getting large. Okay. So here are a couple of limit theorems which are useful for remembering big O, little O. I find the most useful for the little O. The big O uh, for me. Um, is easier to remember in terms of uh, dominating terms. Okay, so uh, assume that f and g are continuous functions, all the same assumptions about everything else, and suppose that g is not equal to zero for all epsilon in this little interval. So the interval is gonna be i delta epsilon, and this is a set, uh, um, notation. This means you take the interval and you're going to punch out the the uh, the center point. Okay, so the interval now is going to be, but I'm punching that point out. So if I write it like this, it looks like that. Okay, so don't include that point. So as long as G is not zero everywhere but that point, okay, then there exists some number L such that the limit as epsilon goes to epsilon naught of the ratio of F to G is equal to L, okay? This limit is some complex number. If I take absolute values, well, what I really mean is take the modulus. Does everyone know what the modulus is for complex numbers? Um, I'll review it, but uh, I, you've probably seen it before. So Z is uh, a, a complex number. That is, it has the writing X plus I, Y, where X and Y are uh, real numbers. Then the modulus is equal to the square root that's the standard square root in real land, x squared plus y squared. Okay, that's the complex modulus. So whenever I take the absolute values of a, of a complex number, what I really mean is the modulus of that complex number, okay? Um, in any case, I'm not dealing directly with modulus, although I could be here. This has a limit and the limit, because both functions are complex valued, is a complex number. If this happens, then f is big O of g as epsilon goes to epsilon naught. 
So if I have this, then I can show big onus. All right, how do I show that? So let's use the, uh, the epsilon delta limit or definition of limit, but keeping in mind that we can't use um, the epsilon, right? Because epsilon is a reserved parameter for something else. All right, now, uh, if you've never seen the epsilon delta definition of a limit before, don't stress out about that. This is something that all, all mathematicians and budding mathematicians see in the course of their lives. It might be something a little bit new for you if you're a physicist or a chemist or an engineer. But what it means is that this guy has a limit if and only if, given any small number, okay? I'm not calling it a small number, but that's how you should think about it. Any small number rho, there exists a number beta, which can depend on X and rho. That has to be positive, such that if epsilon is in this interval, okay, so it's in punched out interval intersected with this smaller interval. So that interval looks like, it's not actually an interval anymore. So there's the punched out interval. Epsilon naught is missing. Here's epsilon naught minus uh, delta, epsilon naught plus delta. And the intersection of that with the smaller domain or the smaller interval, namely this interval here. Actually, it doesn't have to be smaller. It could be larger, I guess. But let's say it's smaller. There it is. If I take the intersection of that, then the new uh, dom the new interval or quasi interval that I'm looking at is that thing in red. Okay. So if epsilon is in that smaller place, smaller region, then it follows that f of x epsilon over g of x epsilon minus l is less than rho. That's the epsilon delta definition of a limit, but without using epsilons and delta because they're reserved for something else. Okay, so now think about the target. What, what do we have to show to prove this result holds? I'm going to use something called the reverse triangle inequality, but first I'm going to multiply it everywhere through by g of x uh, epsilon. And I keep in mind that g of x epsilon by my assumption is not zero, right? So I can multiply through by it. And if I'm actually, I'm multiplying through by the absolute value of that, right? So just take this part first, forget this part here, and just focus on this part. That's exactly the last statement I have. All I do is multiply through by the absolute value, or I should say better yet, the modulus of that function g. And then I get this. And, but there's this something called the reverse triangle inequality. How many of you have heard of that before? Reverse triangle inequality. Okay, so if you haven't, it's okay. Reverse triangle inequality says that the absolute value of a difference, x minus y, is greater than the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of y. That's called the reverse triangle inequality. It's a couple line proof. Um, I'm not going to go through it here, but uh, we're just going to use that fact. So I'm going to use it up here, and F is going to play the role of X, and this guy is going to play the role of Y. And so if I do that, I get all of this. Okay. Now you'll notice that I can take this term and I can isolate it. This term and this term have the same, have a common factor, right? Which I can pull out using the distributive property. When I move this guy to this side over here, side is buddy, it loses the minus sign and gains a plus sign, right? And so I get f of x epsilon is less than absolute value of L plus rho g of x epsilon and absolute value. Okay, and all of this is true provided that epsilon is in that punched out interval, okay? So now what I'm going to do, I can take delta to be the minimum of delta and beta. That's a technical, there's a technical reason to do that. And then I notice that if I'm in that, if I'm that close to epsilon naught, 
then I can use this guy as my constant C. Notice that this is exactly the definition or this is exactly the form of the, the thing that I wanted to show in my definition to establish big O of G. Okay, so because I can establish this with a C and a delta, I know that F is big O of G, period. Okay, so that's an equivalent way of understanding uh, big O-ness, okay? If you can get a limit by taking the limit of the quotient, get a finite limit, okay? By finite, I mean this is gonna be a complex number, but it's not blowing up to infinity, then F and G are big O of each other. Well, F is big O of G, okay? The roles of these two guys are important. Any questions about that? Um, the proofs in this course can get a little bit more complicated than that, but I'm never going to have you remember a proof. The proofs are supposed to be instructive, and if they're not instructive, then you have to just kind of brush it off and kind of not worry about it, okay? Um, what can you do if you don't understand the proof? Well, you can read it five times. Um, if you don't understand it the fifth time, you might the sixth, I don't know. But don't feel discouraged that you won't understand the material of the course. If you don't understand the proof, then just understand and appreciate and use the result of the proof, which is namely that this, this quotient has a limit. If I can establish the converse true, I'll let you um, have a look at that. Okay. Maybe. You're a good mathematician, Calvin. Every good mathematician pushes the boundaries. Eh, good physicists push the boundaries too, but they push the boundaries of the physical understanding. Good mathematicians push the boundaries of their mathematical understanding, right? <clears throat> a proposition. This one is easy to state and a little bit harder to prove, but we're going to end here. Little o implies big O. So if I can prove that two fun that f is um, little o of g, then f is also big O of g, it turns out. Okay. So, and we'll talk about some examples of that next time. And uh, we'll do some more do some more theory next time. And then finally, we'll get into some examples involving little o. I promised some little examples involving little, little o. Sorry, I th think I said that wrong. I promised some examples involving little o. We will get to those. All right. So see you next time.